Yeah, the reason we're all here today is we're trying to tell computers what to do. That's really at the core of everything we're doing. And the way we have been trying to tell computers what to do really has changed quite a lot over time. Um, in the beginning, well, we had rules and instructions. So that's stuff like conditional logic or regular expressions. And now, with machine learning, we unlocked another way of telling computers what to do, and that's programming by example, also called supervised learning. And now, with in-context learning, we have yet another way of telling the computer what to do, and that's with natural language prompts. And there are kind of pros and cons here. Instructions, um, well, they're inherently human-shaped, so they make it very easy for non-experts to get started, because you can tell a computer what to do the way you would tell a human what to do. But if the data changes, if the model changes, we have a risk of data drift, and then our rules won't apply anymore. Now, examples, on the other hand, they can also be very powerful, because they let you express nuanced behaviors, and these kind of things where you know the answer, but you can't quite um, express it in words uh, what you mean. And they're also a great way to inject knowledge from um, your very specific task and use case into your application. But of course, as you all know, it's quite labor intensive to create them. So what's the solution? What's coming in the future? How are we going to tell computers what to do? And how can we maybe combine the best of both worlds uh, and build better systems that way? This is something I'll be talking about today in my talk. And now, you've probably all interacted with large language models or large generative models before. Maybe you've used ChatGPT um, as a user-facing application. Maybe you've used one of the underlying models, like GPT-4. And these models have really caught on because they give you very good contextual results. So um, there's a lot of knowledge about the language and the world um, that they can make available to you. And they're also really easy to get started with. All you need is a prompt. And that makes them really good for fast prototyping. But in industry use cases, there are also some challenges. And one of them is, even if you're using an open source model um, that you run yourself, it's actually quite difficult to figure out what is going on under the hood. Because you have one monolithic model, and you can't just work on the components independently. And uh, because the models are large, well, they're also quite slow. And if you're using an API, well, you're kind of at the mercy of the API provider. And if your data is very sensitive, you can't just send it to an API. And then you need to probably run a model yourself, and then you're hitting the efficiency problems again. So how can we fix that? If we're trying to tell a model what to do and perform a very task-specific um, task and produce task-specific output, what we normally do is we start out with a prompt template, a corresponding parser, and then we use that to extract the structured output. And that's actually also something we thought about quite a lot when we built Spacey LLM, which is the extension to Spacey that prompts the model and transforms the output to structured data. And now, of course, you can take that and ship it to production, but you can also take it one step further. And you can essentially break down your model into smaller task-specific components. And the advantage here is that you really end up with a modular pipeline of components you can work on independently. And uh, these components are also really small and fast. And I'll show you some cool examples of this later. And of course, that means you can run them in-house in an entirely data private environment. And of course, we don't just want to um, replicate what the LLM is doing here, because chances are it will make mistakes. Even the most accurate model will get things wrong, so we need to have a human in the loop and fix them. And first thing, well, we also need to have a way to figure out if anything we're doing is actually making a difference. And for that, we usually want to start out with an evaluation and have a baseline, because that's, that's what we're up against. That's what we need to beat. And then we can use the model and prompt it using all the weights it has available and pipe that forward into an efficient interface that a human can interact with. And so in this example, that's our annotation tool, Prodigy, and the user can then make corrections if needed and essentially curate 
a data set that's very specific to the one thing you want the model to do. And using transfer learning, you can then take that and train your own task-specific component. And ideally, you want to do that until you either beat or ideally exceed the baseline. And just because there's so much talk about in-context learning, and that's what so much of the research is focusing on, it doesn't mean that transfer learning is somehow outdated or has been replaced. It's simply a different technique that you can use and have in your toolbox, and that lets you use task-specific examples in probably the most scalable way. And to give you an example of how this looks in practice, I brought you this case study. Um, it's with a company called S&P Global, a large financial services company. And what they're doing in this project is they're extracting uh, insights uh, from commodities trading. So if crude oil is traded somewhere, they want to extract the participants, the price, and other structured at attributes and make that available as a feed for their customers. And now, this is really information that can significantly move the markets and impact the economy. So it's very important that the system runs entirely in-house. And um, even in their office, it's very segregated. I went to visit them a while ago in London, and their analysts really sit in this glass box that you can only access with a key card. So uh, data privacy is absolutely crucial for that system. And what they did it was they basically used an LLM during annotation to help them create the data. And with a clever and efficient uh, setup, they were able to develop their data 10 times faster. And they currently have eight market pipelines in production, probably even more by now. And if we're looking at the more specific results, we can, of course, see that they were able to achieve very high accuracy. And really fast and small models, um, so let that sink in, six megabytes for one component. That's super cool. And we can also see the data development time. So that's the time it would have taken a single person to create data for that component. And uh, 15 hours, so um, with two people, that's basically a bit less than a work day. And if you think about other things you've spent time on as a developer, you've probably spent more time getting your GPU to work or getting CUDA installed. So we see it's absolutely doable. Um, it's not um, labor intensive anymore, um, and it can totally be done. And now you might ask yourself, well, what's their secret? Well, in one word, refactoring. You might be familiar with refactoring from refactoring code. You probably do that all the time as a developer. But the same also applies to your data. Because in traditional software development, well, you have code that goes through a compiler, and at the end of it, you get a program out of it. And in software 2.0 or machine learning, you have data. That data goes through an algorithm, and at the end of it, you get a model out of it. And if you want to check if um, you know, your changes are having an impact and how your system is performing, you usually have tests. Or in the case of machine learning, you have an evaluation. And if you don't like uh, what your program is doing and you're not happy with it, well, you can go and tweak the compiler. But you probably wouldn't do that. You would probably change your code and work on that. And the same is true for data. And now you might be thinking, well, do I really need this? Uh, can't the LLM just figure this out by itself? What if I want to do something that's pretty simple? And to illustrate the potential problems here, I've brought you a little example. So we have two sentences here. I love cats and I hate cats. And now the question is, are these two sentences similar? Maybe we can do a little show of hands here in the audience. Who thinks these two sentences are similar? Just raise your hand. Yeah? And who thinks they're not similar? Yeah, it's about 50-50. About and of course, as you might have guessed, this was a trick question, because the answer is, well, it depends. Out of all the things you could possibly say in the English language, these two sentences are really similar. They express sentiment about cats. But if you're building something like a dating app, well, you probably want to consider these two sentences as incredibly dissimilar. 
and um, not match people up um, if they have that text in their profile. So the application context is really crucial. And if you can't figure out what you want, no model is magically going to be able to solve that for you. And to show you another example that also shows that the good news really is that in a lot of applications and things you're building, you kind of know quite specifically what you want. And this case study um, that we did with GitLab, uh, they basically um, faced the same situation. So their task was they wanted to extract actionable insights from support tickets and usage questions. And if you think about support tickets, well, they can actually leak a lot of information. So it had to run in an entirely secure and data private environment. And um, it also had to be easy to adapt to new scenarios and new business questions, and also information that changes over time, like which version is the latest um, or which feature was just released. And what they did was they took a step back and they basically separated the general purpose logic from specific business logic and were able to build a very efficient pipeline that's um, completely focused on the structured data and that can very easily be adjusted when new business questions comes in. And instead of approaching the same question as an entirely new machine learning problem. And now, ultimately, they end up with a system that's pretty much interface agnostic. They can use the data directly, or they can add an interface on top. So for example, a natural language interface that summarizes the findings as a sentence. Because ultimately, natural language is really just that. It's a different interface. And a lot of people often use Gen AI or large language models synonymously with chatbots. And I think that's actually very dangerous because people end up building systems that are eff effectively much worse than they should be. And if we're thinking about solutions we want to build and automating human tasks, which is a big part of probably what we're all doing, I always like to look back into the past and look at problems we've already solved and how we did it and what we can also learn from that. And one of my absolute favorite examples is this one. So uh, up into, until the 1950s, people would hire so-called knocker-uppers. And those were literally people with a stick, and they would walk around the neighborhood and knock on people's windows. And that was before alarm clocks um, were widely available and also reliable enough. So if you could afford it, you would hire someone to do this for you. And of course, we have solved this problem with technology. This job has long died out. But we solved it quite differently from what was most effective for the human to do. We built alarm clocks. We didn't build window knocking machines. And <laughs> that leads me to something that I like to call the window knocking machine test. So whenever you're tasked with automating something that a human was previously doing, you can ask yourself, are you building an alarm clock or are you building a window knocking machine? Because you don't want to be building the window knocking machine. And I think we're currently seeing a lot of window knocking machines um, being built or conceptualized. So to give you an example of this in a tech context, this is a very classic task. Um, people have been trying to automate this for a very long time, and that's the jobs of a personal assistant, and especially scheduling appointments, which you might be able to relate to. And here we have a classic chatbot, which absolutely is possible with the technology we have available today, trying to navigate, finding a slot, and also time zones. And a different approach that doesn't actually need AI at its core is a product called Calendly, which I highly recommend if you haven't used it. Um, it's great. And it gives you a link that you can share to your calendar. It syncs with your calendar. And the other person can then book a slot. It converts their time zones. It syncs with their calendar. So if you're looking at this, you can also think of Calendly as the alarm clock, solving a problem where the chatbot really is the window knocking machine. And not all examples are this clear cut. With 
the latest advancements in Gen AI that we have available, we can build really powerful systems. And we can also build systems that essentially let you chat with your data. And we'll probably be hearing a lot more about retrieval augmented generation or RAG. Um, but this really lets you make database queries, and it enables interfaces like this. And those interfaces can replace other previous user interfaces, like a graphical user interface, where you can access the raw data um, and look at it this way. And in this example, well, it's not clear What's the window knocking machine? What's the alarm clock? Well, it really depends on the use case, and it, it, it depends on the intended usage. And I think one big mistake people make, and one big misconception, is that in order to make a product experience simpler, the solution is to add more layers of abstraction on top. But all abstractions leak, and that's kind of how you end up with these uh, products that, are, that promise one click, one line of code solutions, but that really fall apart as soon as a user is trying to do something that the developers hadn't intended. So whether or not something is the best interface to use really depends on your product. And no AI can magically solve that for you and make the product decisions for you. And that's a very important um, aspect to consider who's going to use your app, and which interface do you choose, and what's the risk of the window knocking machine you might be building. So to summarize, if you're using Gen AI in an applied context, I think it's very important to take a step back and reason about what you're doing, and also refactor both your code and your data, because the data really holds what's specific to your application. And that's really the key to everything you're building. And you should also expect surprises as soon as you start engaging with your data, interacting with it, and trying to figure out what the business logic is and um, how you need to structure and break down your task. And there's also a lot more than just chatbots. There are many more use cases for generative AI beyond that. And when you're tasked with building a system, ask yourself, am I, build am I building a window knocking machine? Because you really don't want to be doing that. And finally, as we've seen, just easier isn't ambitious enough, in my opinion. We've seen that there's absolutely no reason to compromise on best practices in software development, like transparency and modularity, and also efficiency, speed, and especially data privacy. Big tech companies might be telling you that all you need is a bigger and bigger monolithic model, but the rest of us don't have to believe them. Thank you.